how do we gain fat? This might seem obvious to some people, but it might be a very good idea to know the specifics if you are trying to avoid putting fat on. By the way, this video is not about calories. Let's go. In this video, we're going to really break down what makes you gain fat. This is not common knowledge, as you can clearly see both obese populations and fit people struggle maintaining or progressing their physique. What you will learn today is a simple way to analyse whether something you do is going to cause weight gain. We hope you dig this video. It's really good. And if you follow us and watch to the end, you will no longer have to miss out on having that extra control over what your body does. Now, we know you think this is all about calories, but let us put a question to you. Why is obesity a problem? And why do we gain fat despite making dietary choices that seem logical, like eating lots of protein or not having too many calories? Is obesity a choice? If not, why do so many people get it wrong when it comes to being overweight? Surely not everyone is lazy. Some people do actually exercise hard and eat well, yet fat gain remains a problem that only a few people crack. You have probably heard that fat gain is a direct result of having too many calories. This is neither true nor false. While calories can be a useful tool when it comes to tracking your dietary food intake, they can mislead you when it comes to fat loss and fat gain. Before we go any further, it's important to understand that not gaining fat is not the same as losing fat. Fat loss is a result of lipolysis followed by lipid oxidation, what we call fat breaking and fat burning. Whereas fat gain is a result of lipogenesis and in turn, adipogenesis. This is something we cover in depth in our official series, which you can find at youtube.com forward slash bellyproof. If you want to finally understand how it works. Not as simple as the basic concept of calories in or calories out perhaps, but there are benefits in understanding what really drives those reactions. Okay, okay, if it's not calories, then what is it? What's on today's menu? Today, we are going to cover what drives lipogenesis and adipogenesis, two terms synonymous with weight gain. Okay, so like everything related to weight, Gaining weight is a direct result of how we eat and train. And no, we still don't mean calories. Here are the basics. The two most important ingredients to fat gain are A, blood sugar, and B, insulin in your blood, which is secreted in response to your blood sugar levels increasing. Insulin triggers little gateways on fat cells. Those are called GLUT4 or glucose transporters type 4 and they are really good at transporting glucose, i.e. blood sugar, into the fat cells. We know it's a bit confusing. So, just to recap. If you have too much blood sugar or glucose in your system, your body knows it's dangerous and knows it has to reduce those blood sugar levels to keep you alive. It then triggers a release of insulin, which also enters your bloodstream. And when insulin passes fat cells, it tells them to suck that sugar in. And it does so by expressing those glucose transporters on fat cells. One minute you have too much blood sugar and the next, oh, it's all okay because all that sugar has moved from the blood into the fat cells. It then gets converted into fatty acids and stored in formations we call triglycerides. So if a fat cell is a prison cell, those triglycerides are the prisoners. This is how glucose gets transported and converted into triglycerides, which is what gets stored in your fat cells. Lipogenesis. Lipo means fat and genesis means creation. And when you fill up that fat cell, there is no more space to store all that excess sugar. But the body is smart, so it creates more fat cells. This is a process we call adipogenesis. At first, you fill up your fat cells, and when they are full, your body creates even more fat cells it can fill. An endless process we call fat gain. When it's time to lose fat, you extract the content of the fat cells 
but the fat cell remains there. It just sits there, empty, waiting to absorb like a sponge, plotting on how it's going to make you fat again. <laughs> <laughs> Causing fat cells to self-destruct, a term known as apoptosis, is possible. But it takes a lot of intentional effort. This is so important for you to understand because the more fat cells you have, the easier it will be for you to gain fat. You simply have more space to be filled with glucose and converted into triglycerides. To give you an example, Ziggy and Pepper are identical twins. Same age, same height, same genetics, same everything. Ziggy has always been lean, but Pepper has had a few years of bad lifestyle choices and overeating which have led to weight gain. Lucky for Pepper, he found a way to turn his fortune around. He's lost all his excess weight and he's now the same weight as Ziggy. But there is a difference. Because fat cells don't self-destruct so easily, Pepper has more fat cells. They're just empty fat cells. The more fat cells you have, even if they are empty, the easier it will be to fill those fat cells and gain body fat. If Pepper and Ziggy decided to go out and eat lots of carbohydrates, Ziggy is now less likely to put on weight. But Pepper is very likely because he has more fat cells that are empty and are ready to absorb that sugar. Now here's a serious question. What is the best way to put on weight? You know, so you can know what to avoid. Unless, of course, you're us and you get fat on purpose to lose it for a YouTube project. <laughs> the best ways to gain weight are A, having breakfast. B, frequent eating. And C, choosing foods which are high in sugar and or carbs. Contrary to popular belief, breakfast is not the most important meal of the day. Although your fat cells will probably think it is. It completely opens up your appetite for the rest of the day. And we all know where that leads, to snacking, also known as frequent eating. Of course, not every breakfast or snack is nutritionally equal. You can have eggs for breakfast or a protein shake as a snack, neither of which are too sugary or carby. Even a healthy breakfast will still open your appetite, tempting you to snack more frequently. But it's still not the best practice as anything you eat will raise insulin and express those glucose transporters on fat cells, which opens a direct doorway for your glucose to be absorbed right into the fat cell. And if you eat frequently, even if it's what you believe is the right stuff, you will open those doorways to the fat cells frequently. If on the other hand, you reduce sugar and carb intake, what we call going low carb, and limit the times of day when you eat, something known as intermittent fasting, you will have less glucose transporters ready to store glucose as fat, as well as less glucose. In other words, you decrease the likelihood of storing fat. This doesn't equal fat loss, but it's a good base to start from. Ah, oh, now I understand. So, if you've been told to eat your breakfast to speed your metabolism up or whatever, think again. And if you've been thinking that an apple as a snack can do no harm, think again. An average apple contains 21 grams of sugar. Be it a healthy snack as opposed to a processed one, it's still considered a sugary snack. And if you've been blaming calories, you might have been misled in the wrong direction. Low calories usually mean low dietary fat, but also high sugar. You can eat low calories and still overload sugar and insulin, and you can eat high calories and not do so. We hope this is starting to make sense why we are losing the fight against obesity, because being overweight is first and foremost about not understanding what drives fat gain. We suggest you focus on reducing your sugar and carb intake, which is much more important, and stop worrying about the increased calories this will result in. We also suggest you reduce the frequency of the meals to reduce the opportunities insulin gets to express glucose transporters. All in all, by not raising blood sugar levels high and not raising insulin so frequently, you are less likely to gain weight. Remember, your body doesn't store excess calories as body fat. It does, however, store glucose, or blood sugar, into existing fat cells. And if you keep storing fatty acids in fat cells, your body will keep creating new fat cells. This is what drives fat gain, lipogenesis and adipogenesis. Not so much about calories, as we said in the beginning of the video. Finally, we want to give you one last tip. 
Fat cells are not the only cells with those glucose transporters on them. Muscle cells have them too, and they have the ability to store excess blood sugar as glycogen. This means that with the right strategy, muscle mass can be used in a way to create competition for fat storage, helping you stay leaner. We will cover this strategy in another video, so keep an eye on the channel. And until next time, stay belly proof.